Do the Grateful Dead matter? This is Robert Manny, host of Guys Guys TV, and this week my special guest is author Michael Benson. We're going to talk all about the dead right here, right now on Guys Guys TV. You can also catch me on KCAA Radio here in Southern California, Guys Guys Radio, my worldwide podcast, and now we're on UK Health Radio all weekend long. Guys Guys TV, Guys Guys Radio, thanks for your support and keep on trucking. Okay, Guys Guys Radio, the interview portion of our show, and today we're going to talk about the Grateful Dead. I know there's millions of deadheads out there. Most of them are in the U.S., but their music is all around the world. But the big base of the Grateful Dead is right here in the good old USA, and we're going to learn about that and more from Michael Benson. Michael Benson's been on the show before. He's published over 60 books. He wears a Steal Your Face hoodie. He's attended dozens of dead shows. I've uh, attended about maybe about six or eight, and he still has roots for the Lithuanian basketball team during the Summer Olympics that Bill Walton was uh, supporting. Uh, Mike, Michael's books include vintage science fiction films, Who's Who in the JFK Assassination, Ballparks in North America, maybe we've got another show there, Inside Secret Societies, Killer Twins, and also we talked about um, his book about the Nazis um, in the United States prior to World War II. And that was our most recent discussion. So the, why Grateful Dead is, why the Grateful Dead is the, the book we're going to talk about today and the Grateful Dead itself. And it's a cohesive essay. It's really a terrific book. It answers the titular question, gauging the relevance of the band from a wide variety of angles. Uh, the book, it looks at the dead up close and from afar in the concrete and the abstract from the personal to the remote with immediacy and nostalgia Michael Benson is an award-winning poet, and he brings the music of the language to his prose. It's a very well-written, fun book to read. He analyzes dead lyrics with a scholarly awareness of verse and zen. So <laughs> start right now. Enough of this. Let's bring him out. Michael Benson, welcome back to Guys Guys Radio. How are hey, you, Michael? Hey, thanks for having me, Robert. Well, uh, as a subject, I was going through some of your many books, and you write about so many different subject matters, and I saw Dead, The Grateful Dead here. And the name of the book, once again, is why the Grateful Dead Matter. It came out a few years ago, but it's been endorsed by the Dennis McNally, the Grateful Dead publicist. He says, anyone who acknowledges the inherent the validity of someone else's spiritual experience and becoming a deadhead was nothing if not a spiritual transformation will find a fascinating wealth of information in Michael Benson's glorious manifesto. So tell us about, Michael, how you got into the Grateful Dead and more importantly, what is the Grateful Dead? Okay, uh, let me start by saying that uh, a few years back, quite a few years now, uh, Pete Hamill, the newspaper columnist uh, and book writer, wrote a book called Why Sinatra Matters. And it was a beautiful little book. Uh, and it wasn't just about Sinatra, the great singer or a great actor or about his influence on show business even, but it was about the stamp he put on American culture. Um, he changed what we perceive as cool. Uh, he offered Italian Americans a pride and a sense of belonging here in America that they hadn't felt before. So in about 2014, Steve Hull uh, at the University Press of New England decided that it was about time that someone gave the same treatment to the Grateful Dead. Um, to write a beautiful little book. I mean, many books about the dead are, are tabletop books. This one you can put in your pocket, you can put in your purse, you can uh, take it to the beach. And uh, it also can, uh, it can rest on the commode because the chapters are mm -hmm. short and it's a good place for it. Um, you, but don't again, have, you don't have to read them in order either. You can just pick oh, up the book and read a chapter. You can open the book to any page and yep. it'll be fine. Um, but it's, it's, it's not so much about the, um, the, the music, although a large part of it is, but it's also about uh, the permanent thumbprint they put on Western civilization. And the book contains 34 reasons why the Grateful Dead matter. I, I argued at the time that it should be why the Grateful Dead matters because it's a single entity. And they answered, it was an academic press. They answered, well, we thought that matter made it more metaphysical. Mm -hmm. I said, yeah, okay. 
Well, let's let's let's, let's put it into context, Michael. You've yeah. got the Beatles and the Stones and the Who and Led Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and you've got the Grateful Dead. What the Grateful Dead very different experience. Their music mm. is different. It went through a lot of different iterations over time from the psychedelic to the Americana kind of folky and then into more commercial. They're known for their concerts. Their concerts, they allowed bootleggers to listen to their music. And then with the Dick's Picks and all the others, there's so many live concerts that are being released and all the other bands have followed suit in that. And the other really interesting thing about The Dead for me is that they really didn't have a hit song until the very end of their career, Touch of Grey. And they've yeah. had so many great songs and it was just an FM phenomena. And even the critics, I remember reading Rolling Stone and they were reviewing uh, Wake of the Flood and they said like, oh, here's the Grateful Dead. They sound like mooing cows, I remember, the vocals on one of the tracks there. And they, they really had been given a hard time by kind of the industry and also the critics, yet their fans, when you're a deadhead, you're a deadhead and you love what they do and their experience is different. So talk to us about all of that. Well, as far as the hit single goes, I think Touch of Grey uh probably did more damage than good it brought in a lot of neophytes and the, and the concerts became something other than what they used to be which was a celebration almost a religious experience now suddenly you had kids who were hearing them on the on the radio showing up and not knowing what to do you know you're not supposed to drink too much beer you're, you're supposed to stay mellow and you're not supposed to start yeah. fights and there was some of that um uh, and they had sabotaged previous uh chances to have hit singles uh, Uncle John's band could have been a hit single, except for there's a single word in the lyrics that they refused to remove, and uh, it was played on FM only. Um, and I think the thing, the, the key point is that they could not play the same song the same way twice. Uh, it, hu human beings, when they tend to make copies, make identical copies, like a like a Xerox machine. Uh, the, the Grateful Dead. We're more like nature. Uh, nature makes snowflakes. And snowflakes, although from afar, they, they look similar. Up close, they're all absolutely unique. And that's the way it was with Grateful Dead shows. Uh, you can have 500, I, I still call them tapes because I'm, I'm an old guy, but you can have 500 you know, concerts on your on your hard drive and you still want the, the one you don't have because it's gonna have that moment that sublime moment that it doesn't appear in any other concert they ever did. You know, I know that, you know, I, I know my favorite morning do I, you know, I know my, my favorite, uh, my favorite wharf rat uh, and all of them are great, but there are those that are just, they, they, they put you in a place where no other band can put you. Uh, I, I always compared Jerry's playing with Miles Davis. Uh, I, I, I wish that we could go back in time and have those two put on a show together because that would have been just incredible. Five times, Miles warmed up for the dead at the Fillmore West, and Jerry was like a sponge. And I, 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 I ran into that historical fact backwards because I'm listening to a jam on, on one of my CDs, and I'm going, hey, that sketch is a Spain. You know, and then I look like it's called Spanish Jam. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I get it. Um, yeah, and the, the, not only were the concerts all identical, uh, no two dead songs seem to have the same roots. It's more like a stew, like a gumbo. Um, they they didn't uh, they didn't fuse types of music um, like jazz and rock and roll. I've, I've heard that fusion music. Uh, they didn't do that. They they crossbred music. So that songs would come out with little tastes of different ethnicities, different rhythms. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the the different interests of the members of the band. They're, they're kind of an eclectic group. Okay, let's get into that. Let's sure. let's go back to their beginnings, Michael. Yeah. Um, San Francisco, Haight-Ashbury, the height of kind of the, 19, the early, mid-60s, if you will. Um, LSD was still legal at the time, I That's think right. up until 1965. And they had, uh, they used to play and they had a seminal concert, I believe. It was a free concert where they just went down to one of the streets, plugged in, and played, and everybody came, and that, you know, the rest is history. Tell, tell us about their beginnings, who they were, and what led them to that point. Who are these well, guys? They came together organically. Uh, Jerry was a, uh, 
that's Jerry Garcia, the lead mm -hmm. guitarist. He was a, a folky who had a, a, an act with his girlfriend. Um, he did Robert Hunter and he would do, you know, Robert Hunter would play stand up bass and Jerry would play banjo. And they were folkies. Uh, Phil Lesh was an experimental musician and a classical composer. He had written a symphony for four orchestras with the audience sitting in the middle. Uh, I don't think it was ever performed, but it was an interesting thought. Uh, so he and he introduced to the band the the um, the concept of improvisation, which had never occurred to anybody else. Um, and Bill was was a a solid drummer. He he was uh, necessary because he had a station wagon, and they carried their entire sound system in Billy's <laughs> Billy's station wagon, which is pretty amazing because you know. That's, but 10 years later, it took multiple trucks and a convoy to get the wall of sound set up for, for dead, dead shows, which could then pull uh, complaints for noise from other states. Um, it had uh, Bob Weir. Uh, Bob Weir, uh, I guess to, to put it bluntly, was supposed to be the chick magnet. Uh, he was younger and, and had, had, had the longest hair, the mischievous attitude. Uh, and he sang, considering the fact that he looked like a woman when he was 18, he sang surprisingly macho songs. He sang cowboy songs mm -hmm. uh, and brought Western music into the mix. Um, and then you had Ron McKernan, Pigpen, who was the initial leader of the band. He was a white blues singer, uh, played, played keyboards. And the initial dead jams would be backing up Pigpen and you know doing Sadie Mae for for fifteen minutes, or Turn on Your Love Light usually ended concerts with him up front singing the song. Um, so, and together, they uh, their first gigs had to do with psychedelics. A fellow named Ken Kesey, his famous writer, um, he was putting together these events. Uh, experimental events called acid tests. Right. The Merry and Pranksters, the, was that him? The Merry Pranksters? The, the Merry Pranksters, right. That's, that's where Mountain Girl came from, uh, Jerry's mm -hmm. first first old lady. Um, and they would they would ride around on a bus that said further on front and was psychedelically painted. Uh, they came east, but they didn't like the scene. The psychedelic scene was here, was, was, was kind of, eh. The uh, college professors had sort of taken over the, uh, the, the acid tests in the East Coast. But they out west, Ken Kesey would put on these parties. Everybody would dose when they came in, and uh, there would be lots of strobe lights and different sound and visual things going on. Uh, Kesey himself would walk around saying things like, stay inside your own movie, stay inside your own mm -hmm. movie. And the dead would come out, and they would play. And they, sometimes they'd play one song that lasted an hour and a half. Uh, sometimes they'd go through, make, it, make it through a set. Sometimes, uh, and I suspect this didn't happen that often, but... Uh, According to Jerry, they would come out, they would play a couple of notes and then drop their instruments and go party with everybody else. And nobody cared. Uh, it, it, did, it didn't matter if they were good or not. And it really wasn't until they ran into a fellow named Owsley, uh, who was a rich kid from back east, who had a grandfather who was a U.S. senator, who believed in them. He was their first benefactor. He, he put them up in an apartment in Haight-Ashbury. He paid all the bills and told them that they could be good if they just worked at it. Uh, working at it was, was a little bit of a struggle at first, uh, and, but they eventually they got a record contract and uh, had, a, had a couple of, couple of eh, interesting studio yeah, let's records talk about they that. put on. Let's talk about the albums for a minute. Um, my special yeah. guest, Michael Benson, has written the book, Why the Grateful Dead Matter. We're having a conversation. Got two deadheads. I'm a mini deadhead. Michael's a real deadhead. I'm a, much more into the stones and I want to do a comparison there. <laughs> um, with the yeah. albums, what I always found interesting because I got into the dead in, uh, in high at the end of high school and then in college and I went back, right. I heard Working Man's Dead and then American Beauty and I was yep. hooked. And then I went back and listened to their first three albums, Grateful Dead, Aya, Amaxa, Maxa, what was Oxa, it? Aksa Maxoa. Aksa Maxoa and uh, Anthem of the Sun. And I'm right. like, these are pretty trippy. And the, it, they really flipped a switch when they went to their two seminal albums, in my opinion, uh, when they did Working Man's Dead, American Beauty, 
the uh, Skull and Roses live LP with Bertha right. that kicked it off, and then oh, the Europe, then Europe seventy two. So, and then they did some other studio albums uh, that were kind of, in my opinion, they they, they weren't at the same level as those two, um, Working Man's Dead and American Beauty, which which hold up so well. So, what happened that made them flip the switch to go from the psychedelic to the Americana music? Well, I think they were, they were pale, like many of the top musicians of the day. They were pals with Dave Crosby, mm -hmm. recently passed away. And, you know, he said, man, you know, what you got to do is you got to write real songs. And they managed to do that for most of 1970 uh, and it, with Robert Hunter writing lyrics that were, they weren't like China Cat, Sunflower and, and, uh, and Dark Star. They weren't trippy lyrics anymore. They were telling these stories that seemed to come out of Americana. Um, they came out of a, a nostalgic world in which uh, the hero was was usually down and out. He had a gambling problem often, uh, but he always had time to, to sit and talk to a bum who was who said, hey, mister, you got a dime. Uh, and I, I suspect that it was, it was a, a little bit of Robert Hunter himself showing up in, in those songs. And Jerry's only... Uh, rule was please Robert don't write any lyrics I'm going to feel stupid singing mm -hmm. so they were they were cool they were cool they were they were they were westerns and and uh and a lot, of a, type lot, songs. a lot of acoustic too they went from yeah, the psychedelic and, 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 very, to the and very pretty yeah. and very pretty and uh like and I said uh, Uncle, Uncle John's band could have been a hit yeah. single yeah. I think uh trucking was probably too long to be played on the radio at that point mm -hmm. but the, the they stand up so well. Uh, American Beauty and Working Man's Dead are miracles. If they had been a double album, I think we probably would be talking about it as the greatest album of all times. Mm -hmm. um, as it is, they're both in the top 10. Yep, um, I agree. And uh, it that, and like you, those that was my first introduction to the Grateful Dead. Is I, I got Working Man's Dead, mm -hmm. and then I got American Beauty. Um, and then in 1977... I decided uh, it was between my junior and senior year of college. I was going to go discover America and write the great American novel like Hunter Thompson. And it, it didn't work out that way. I did write a novel. You did 60 uh, books, though. So you did pretty darn well, Michael. <laughs> That's right. So and, far. Uh, but and we crossed, I crossed the country and I ran into Jerry Garcia for the first time wow. at, the, at the Keystone Berkeley a saloon in, in Berkeley, California. And Jerry was skinny. He wore black leather. His roadies wore Grateful Dead vests. Um, I remember they said um, Oakland chapter. And in fact, I, I, I showed up early so I could be first in line and I bought a huge bottle of brandy. And by the time the doors opened, I was out of it. I was completely out of it, but I had befriended and I'd shared the brandy and, and befriended the Hell's Angels. And, you know, they propped me up and got me in. And then I, and I went inside and, and passed out in the balcony, at which time the uh, my favorite Hell's Angel, a guy named Rick, came over and said, hey, little dude, you're going to miss the show. <laughs> and, he, and he laid out a line for me of something that looked like brown sugar. <laughs> and I, I snorted it. And I was up for the next 48 hours. Wow. That's an interesting. <laughs> so I think that was crank. I think is did, what they did, called that. Did you, did you get a chance to uh, approach Garcia and just say hello or anything? Oh, no, no, no. I, I, okay. I, I was not in, I was not at my best. Okay. So <laughs> let, let's. But I, I, plus I was in awe. Right. He, of course. he came out and the, he played, the first set was sugary. Wow. 45 minutes. <laughs> And, you know, by the time he got to the last verse, you know, everybody was, everybody was just stunned. This was, this, and just these tremendous leads going on in between. He finishes the song. He says, we'll be back in a few minutes. Let, <laughs> and leaves, played one song for a set. Let's talk about that because I think that's really important. I alluded to my, uh, my being a huge Stones fan. I've seen them like 19 times. And there's the, yeah. there's the good and, the, and there's the not so good when you're a Stones fan to see them live. First of all, they're still at it, and they they're playing as good as now as they did when I first saw them, which was Steel Wheels in 1989, right. and I just saw them a couple of years ago, and they were fabulous. 
uh, Charlie Watts was still with them. And mm -hmm. I was like, wow. And Mick Jagger can still fill up the room. He can still sing out of all those, you know, uh, boomer rock guys. He can sing. The others, uh, not so much as, as good as he can, but he, his voice is still there. So that's really interesting. But the thing is, when you see the Stones, they're going to, they're going to, they have kind of a, a, there's an expectation of the audience where they paid big money and they want to hear, you know, start me up and Jumpin' Jack Flash and Paint It Black and Sympathy for the Devil and Gimme Shell. There's a set of songs that they sure. have to play. Now they claim that, you know, oh, we do it a little bit different each time, but they, they really, they, they stick to the script there. And then they'll sprinkle in four or five different ones because they have like 400 songs or something. When you see the dead, they set up, even though they've played some of the same songs over and over again in multiple shows, it seems like if when I, what I read in your book, they have a framework so they really didn't package things and they would say, okay, here's some of the songs and it's kind of a, a skeleton for them. And then they would see what happened because they made it an experience that they were part of. And that's, that's, that's right. wonderful. That's wonderful. And that's real freedom of, uh, as an artist. The Grateful Dead always insisted on being creators and performers simultaneously, mm -hmm. which is a pressure no other band would put on themselves. Uh, now, you know, the, like the light guy would beg, you know, please tell us what the opening number is going to be. So at least we can get set up and, you know, Bobby say, OK, we're going to open with Bertha. And then, you know, they, they wouldn't. They would go to a different song. And, and sometimes <laughs> the, 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 the way they wove in and out of songs was very odd. Uh, there's one there's one concert where they played 17 minutes of Dark Star. And then there was me and my uncle. They came out of it into me and my uncle. And then the second me and my uncle was over, they went into 15 more minutes of Dark Star. They go, what, what happened there? How did they communicate that right. to one another that they were going to do that right there, then and there? So, I mean, sometimes you catch them with little hand signals and stuff, but they'll tell you that it's because they all tripped together thousands of times during the, the mid 60s and that they're all on the same astral plane and can read each other's minds musically. And this, this strikes me as probably not what's happening. Uh, but I can't tell you what is happening. I can't tell you how how that magic is formed. It's it's they're alchemists in some way. And they're they're using instruments that are are unique, uh, made of special different kinds of wood. I think Phil at one point had a bass where each string went to a different amplifier. So that if he would hit two notes, one would come over here, one would be over here uh and also they incorporated the uh as a kind of the third leg of the stool the audience and their vibe would impact their playing and their creating while they got into their long jams and from my, what i read in your terrific book michael sometimes that really worked and sometimes it didn't work as well and i think further on they got in their career uh the toll of the road and the drugs and the life on the road and all that took took its toll if you will well and, yeah uh, i mean the it was always a risk. I mean, right. you were talking about the high prices of Stones uh, tickets and the expectations of the audience. Right. Uh, Deadheads really came in tabula rasa uh, because some nights the dead were just going to kind of fall apart and noodle for a couple of hours. It, 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 it didn't always work. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I kind of feel sorry because I, last time I went to see Dead and Company, I sat with a, uh, a group of Gonzaga University law students who were traveling with the band for the summer. It's a city field in, in Queens, New York. And they were stunned, first of all, that I'd seen Jerry in person. That made me, that made me special. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I, forgot to say, I forgot where I'm going with this now. Um, Gonzaga students. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the, the Gonzaga students were, uh, and, and they were taking tremendous numbers of drugs. I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend I think I took one hit off of the joint. I was stolen for a couple of days, but then they're just, they're just blasted. Uh, and the, all the conversation is about which song is going to seg into which song. And the, the, I mean, they're totally into the, the dead in company world, which struck me as, and I, and I had a hard time explaining this to them that Jerry Garcia, when he was doing Stella blue could bring this stadium to complete silence and then make them explode. 
and and I said, I'm sorry, you know, John Mayer is a really good guitar player. He is. And uh, I mean, he's, he's just tremendous, you know, rock god. But he can't cast the spell that Jerry could. Uh, and that, that night, O'Teal, the bass player for Dead and Company, sang Comes a Time. And Mayer, of course, played the lead. And, and it, it, there, there were some, and when it was over, it was really, really good. And when it was over, um, I heard somebody in a nearby seat go, that was church, man. <laughs> and, and, I and I turned to the guys from, from Gonzaga and I said, well, that was close. Yeah, but right, it took it took two guys. Okay, Jerry would have done that by himself. All right, let's talk about that. Two guys. Okay. Mike, my, my, my uh, we're two guys here. Robert Manny hosts the Guys Guys Radio. Michael Benson. We're talking about the Grateful Dead and Michael's terrific book, Why the Grateful Dead Matter. So, talking about two guys, it seems like every band you've got two front people. You got uh, Lennon and McCartney. You got yep. Jagger and Richards. You got Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir. Very mm -hmm. different. Very talented. Jerry's a virtuoso on the guitar. We're good, not not in the same league in terms of or style, but he brings his earthiness. He brings the cowboy music, the Western Americana. And what I found most interesting in reading your book is they both had their own lyricists and there were yes. issues with that. And you know, when you have Lennon and McCartney or Jagger Richards, you know, they write their own, you know, they go back and forth with the lyrics. Maybe Keith will have like start me up and then Jagger fills it in or something. And Lennon and McCartney went back and forth, but with Garcia and Weir, they had their own lyricists. And sometimes there was some uh, friction because of that between a particular Bob Weir and Robert Hunter. Is that correct? Well, Robert Hunter at one point refused to write any more words for Bob Weir to sing because, well, Bob Weir, uh, a dyslexic fellow, um, it, it, he plays his rhythm guitar inside out. I mean, there's, it's 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 hard to understand quite what Bob Weir is doing, but when he's not there, they don't sound like the Grateful Dead anymore. Mm -hmm. So whatever he's doing, it, it it's absolutely the essential part of, of the mix, but it's hard to figure it out because no other rhythm guitarist would play it that way. Um, and he, yeah, he does, he has trouble remembering lyrics. I remember the first time I saw the Grateful Dead was at English Town, and I don't think Bob got through an entire song without forgetting, forgetting the lyrics at one point or another. Um, and it, 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 my joke, I think, in the book was they played Truck and 500 times live and Bob got the words right four. <laughs> and, and when he would do this, or, or else, and, and when he would forget, he would fill in whatever, you know, what, what every singer does when they forget the words. They, they, they fill in with other words and make things up as they go along. And, uh, and it just drove Robert Hunter nuts. And he... he so oh, he got his own uh Weir got his own got Barlow, yeah. Barlow. And then they did this terrific album, Ace, which to me is just as good as any Grateful Dead album in there. It's and the 50th anniversary just came out. I was listening to the remix, tremendous remix. Uh unfortunately, when you listen to the live version of it that was recorded recently, you know, you can see the difference. The age has set in there on his voice. Um, he's still, you know, listen, he's a tremendous guitar player, rhythm guitar player, he plays his own style. Uh, I guess my question was, he, how is he different from Jerry and how do they make that work? And why do they have their own lyricists? You just explained that. Well, well, yeah, well, Robert Hunter wouldn't work with, with Bobby Weir anymore. So Weir had to get his own lyricist. Um, but why did they go outside in the first place? I guess because they couldn't. Okay. I'm not everybody can write in words. Mm -hmm. Um and hunters and they're, 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 you know, I mean, Bert, Bert Backrack needed Hal mm -hmm. David. Mm -hmm. um, Elton John needed Bernie Toppin. Right, I got you. So they, okay. they, I think that uh, lyricists are, are part of show business uh, tradition. Uh, the fact that Lennon McCartney did both and that uh, Jagger Richards did both, uh, pretty stunning. I mean, that's uh, mm -hmm. that, not, that, not that usual. Uh, the King songs, uh, I don't think there are any collaborations ever. Right. So it's with, always with, with Jerry and Weir, in terms of uh, writing, songwriting as a band, I know Truckin was a group effort and it took a long yes. time. The other songs, though, where did they come from? Uh, because they had separate lyricists, who, did one person write the uh, melody? Another one came up with kind of the underpinning or the chords or the rhythm? Or how, how did Weir and Garcia work together if they did work together in terms of song craftsmanship? 
through uh I, I they they did it through practice and i don't i don't mean practice as in rehearsal but as they would they would play a song the first time and it would be bare bones mm -hmm. and then each time they played it and they would play it live in front of people i mean all these experiments are happening right out there they don't their rehearsals would be little snippets of songs uh they would never make it all the way through anything uh they they would do their working on songs to to figure out the spaces in between the notes, what to do, how to fill. Um, they would do that during a show, and these songs grew as they toured, which is why I, the, the 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 series of albums, the, the studio albums that weren't that good um, during the eighties, and uh, I guess it was during the eighties. Bob Weir says that the reason they're not good is because we had just written those songs. I mean, that Fire is... on the Mountain, Fire on the Mountain is is on a, is on a studio record, and it kind of lays there. Mm -hmm. But by the time they get to Cornell, and they're they're sagging it out of Scarlet Begonias, it turns into this fantastic piece of of almost classical music. Yeah. Um, and but but it's it's down the road. They had developed it to that point. That's a great point, Michael, because other bands, um, whether by they have to do it or the record companies are forcing them into it, but they'll come out with an album and then they kind of walk them out on the road and they test out the songs and they sometimes change, but they, they packaged it already and it's done. Whereas the dead would put the song out there and play it live and play it live and let it breathe and then learn about it and then create it as a studio recording. I think that's brilliant and unique. Yes. Well, and, and the other thing that that about the dead that I thought was interesting is they 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 said that once the music was in the air, it belonged to everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the the notion of of this is proprietary didn't occur to them. Um, tapers were always allowed. Yeah. The, 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 I mean, the formal tape taping section to explain to those who never were at a Grateful Dead concert, there was a section in the middle of the hockey arena or the, the stadium that was reserved for tapers. And they would put microphones on the top of tall poles and there would be this section with just a sea of microphones sticking up and everybody was taping the, the show. And I don't think they sold the tapes, they traded tapes. People would trade tapes so that they would be able to hear concerts they weren't able, they weren't able to be at. Um, and the, the whole notion of, of, of allowing that, uh, it, it was also the fan great. base. So great. And they and, don't, of course, they ended up getting mad rich anyway. Right. Well, the other thing that people uh, forget, tie-dye. Tie-dye is mainstream now. The Grateful yes. Dead started tie-dye, right? Bobby Weir picked up a hitchhiker on the way to his ranch. The guy had invented the tie-dye technique. Uh, he said, you know, can I, can I spend a night? Can I sleep in your barn? Sounds like a beginning of a joke. Can I sleep in your barn? Sure, but you got to chop wood for me. So the, the guy was a good worker, so he hung out for a while. And pretty soon, you know, Bob says, what, what are you doing with that sheet? And that's really cool. And the, 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 the first public um, exposure of tie-dye were sheets that the dead would put over their their speakers and the, as backdrops on their stages and and I think probably the next thing that happened would, you know, women were wearing dresses that were tie dyed and they would, they would spin in them. And uh, now every summer camp has tie dye day. It's, it's, it's part amazing. of an Amer it's American tradition. Um, Let me ask you a couple more questions because uh, sure. I want to get them all in here. Um, two drummers. Uh, yes. I always found it fantastic that the dread the, the, the dead had two drummers because for their type of music, I was thinking, well, why did they really need two drummers? Yet it worked and it was seamless. Tell us about why they made that decision. Well, I'm I'm not sure that it was ever a decision. Um, Bill Kreutzmann was the drummer for the Dead, and he met a guy named named uh, named Mickey. And Mickey and Bill, uh, I think, the first 24 hours that they knew each other, they just went around drumming on things, and they realized that they, their brains were, uh, were were kind of in sync with one another. So Bill says, you know, Guys would be okay if, if if Mickey sits in on a show, and he did, and of course the results were really good right away. And uh, after the show, Jerry says, "That's the Grateful Dead." Nice. And and Mickey was around for a, a, a while, and then uh, 
his dad became manager and ran off with the gold. They wrote, he, he's gone about him, you steal the face right off your head. And Mickey was mortified. Uh, he, they didn't blame him for what his dad had done. And uh, they didn't hold him responsible or, or even, you know, but Mickey quit. Mm -hmm. Okay. A um, couple of deaths. So there's been a number of deaths in the yes. virtual, uh, in the various renditions of the Grateful Dead, the, the yes. teammates, if you will. So talk about Pigpen, what that meant when Pigpen passed. He's basically died at the magical age of 27, like so many other rock stars. I can't drinking. even believe that he was only 27. And then, and then Jerry, what were the, what happened uh, when both of those guys passed in terms of the trajectory of the band? Well, when Pigpen died, um, he was still, you know, the heart and soul of the band, but he was also borderline obsolete. They had moved on to more complicated music. Um, they were using new keyboard players at the God Show came in and uh, was playing more complicated things that Pigpen couldn't play. Um, they were the, the, All of the music experimentation was kind of lost on Pigpen to begin with. So the, the, the difference was, I mean, they were very sad. Everybody was very sad when Pigpen died, but to a certain extent, it, it opened up the Grateful Dead to doing the kinds of experimentation for which you know, the great bulk of their fame came. When Jerry died, the Grateful Dead died. I mean, that was it. 1995. Um, I remember uh, I was working at an ad agency. I'll never and forget. Somebody walked by and said, Jerry Garcia just passed and everything went silent. I was at Yankee Stadium and they put it on the scoreboard. Um, and again, yeah, stadium silence. And I was kind of stunned because the baseball crowd, I'm here, I've been at a Yankee game, but everybody went, oh. Yeah. And in San Francisco, slowly but surely, a party started. And Golden Gate Park was filled with with hippies in, in tribute. Uh, they they lowered the San Francisco City flag from the Civic Center in San Francisco, and they put up a flag that was tie dyed, mm -hmm. and everybody awesome. led, and, and flew it at half mast, and everybody looked at that and they knew who that was for. So it was stunning and sad. It took a long time, I think, for the for the dead to regroup. And I, I absolutely know Grateful Dead fans who will never, ever go see a you know, show by Further or the Wolf Brothers. I'm not going to go to Dead and Company. And as long as Jerry remains in perpetual rehab, I'm not going. Uh, but it's, it's kind of sad because it's like saying I'm never going to listen to Beethoven because Beethoven's right. dead. Well, let me ask you this, Michael. As a sure. You're a real deadhead, a true deadhead. What is your take on what happened after Jerry passed and then they kind of broke up, kind of got back together for some reunion stuff. They had the other ones and some other renditions of them. They're still out there um, every year. It seems like there's some version of them that's touring. The mm -hmm. Dicks picks all those live performances that are uh, you know, well recorded are being released constantly. The Dead is really a brand now. Um, probably they never expected that, but it seems like they've done it in a way that, to me, uh, it, it's it's very acceptable. I don't, I don't like. Oh, they they sold out. I don't feel that at all. I'm curious about you as a deadhead. What do you think about all of that? And what do you think about the music now and how they're playing? Is it like, is this like a dead show? I and mean, you mentioned your uh, concert at City Field. Mm -hmm. What what was that like, knowing that you had seen them when they were the really raw beginning dead? Well, I. It's disappointing. Um, you know, I, I guess when you start telling your neighbors in the stands uh, about the, the magic that used to be, it implies the magic's not there anymore. Uh, I'll, and that said, I thought that the Dead and Company show was, was really good. I mean, the drums in space was absolutely apocalyptic. Uh, having O'Teal as the bass player rather than Phil, um, made it less like the Grateful Dead, but more like hit singles that you can dance to. I mean, I, they did a version of uh, Cold Rain and Snow that I said, well, you know, they should just, they should just put this out as a single right now. This is, this is top 10 material. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I and I, I think Beethoven's probably a good analogy that the, that a really good piano player uh, and a, a really good orchestra playing Beethoven is, is, a, a perfect tribute to Beethoven's genius. Right. Okay. Um, you can't just, you can't say, well, Jerry's gone. Jerry's music is gone as well. It's not. I mean, it, it's never going to be quite the same. And luckily we have 
hundreds and hundreds of recordings of Jerry playing. Uh, but if you want to go out and have a Grateful Dead experience with somebody else playing lead guitar with these guys, go have fun. Having mm -hmm. fun's the key thing. Okay, uh, rapid fire. A couple more questions and we'll yeah. wrap up. Um, yep. Okay, Michael Benson, my special guest on Guys, Guys Radio. The book is Why the Grateful Dead Matter. Okay, you're a real deadhead. Best album? Best album is American Beauty. Perhaps the best album of all times. Okay, best song? My favorite is sugary sugary and that's a solo and that's in yes. another interesting point about the dead is that where you have a band like the stones they won't play any solo material the dead welcome solo material oh, all of ace immediately became grateful dead yep it was, it was it's, in fact i it was only just bob weir for days why, why did, you know without going down the rabbit hole why did garcia make his garcia album and weir make ace when they're they're kind of like dead albums why didn't they just do them together? I'm not, I, I, I can't answer that question. I think that, as is true of all groups, sometimes you kind of get tired of being in the same room all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and to get out and work with other people is a, a nice breath of fresh air. And then they took the best of what they created separately and they brought it back home to the family. Got it. Okay, best, um, best live album. Best live album? Oh, well, Skull and Roses. I mean, is is still traumatic. Also, like Live Dead, because the the first time I ever heard Dark Star was on that. Okay, best um of the, of the Dick's Picks. Uh well, it, it is Dick's Picks uh, English Town. Okay, I'm not sure what number it is. I, I also like um, well, I, I'm gonna think Crimson Red and Blue. The it was Philadelphia, July seventh, nineteen eighty nine. Okay. Final words for our listeners out there who may not be as familiar as you are, or maybe I am about the dead. What would you tell them? Why should you check out the Grateful Dead beyond everything they learned from this interview? Listening to the Grateful Dead is a therapeutic experience. If you are stressed and, and everybody is, and if you're fed up with the, with the modern world, you can listen to Grateful Dead. And it's not only takes you to a place where there's nothing left to do but smile, smile, smile. But it takes you to a timeless place where you're no longer old, you're no longer young. Uh, everybody's in, in the same boats floating around on a really, really nice plane. Um, and I'm not sure that other bands can do that for you. Fantastic. Michael, great chat. I really enjoyed it. Thank where, you, Robert. What's what's your website for everybody out there to check out your well, many, I don't, many I don't have a website. I, I'm, uh, I'm at... Author Michael Benson, all one word, author Michael Benson. And with that, you'll get me to Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. Fantastic. Great job. We'll see you again soon, I hope. Thanks, Robert. You Take enjoy care. the guests and content I bring you each and every week to Guys Guys Radio and Guys Guys TV. Please support us by subscribing and following on our platforms. Thank you.